Hello, and welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast. Today, my guest is Scott Howard. Howard is the author of The Transgender Industrial Complex, the native Nebraskan whose first ever book has been predictably banned by Amazon, uncovers the transgender phenomenon by fleshing out its revolutionary foundations and wretched aims. By connecting the dots of the players and pawns, Howard demonstrates through impeccable research and prose that is both advanced and accessible, that this is no warm and fuzzy grassroots, grassroots movement as its advocates would have you believe. Part historical analysis and part journalism, the transgender industrial complex is a wake up call for those who have been sleeping their way towards servitude and annihilation and Lord willing, a call to action for resisting this evil psyop dead set on smashing childhood, family and God. Welcome Scott. Well, glad to be here and uh, that's quite, quite kind of you. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was a uh, it was a fun bio to write and I stole little bits from other people, but yeah. Um, well, I think you deserve it. So first, before we get to know a little bit about you and of course get into the book. Um, okay, what's up with Teen Wolf being your picture? Well, um, I've always been very, uh, very fond of the film. And uh, when I was trying to decide on a pen name, I basically said, well, what the heck, why, why not, right? He transforms. Um, and, uh, you know, I was a basketball player when I was younger, so I, I figured uh, we might as well go with it. Oh, the transform part I wasn't even thinking about. Yeah, that's pretty obvious now. <laughs> <laughs> so as we've just discussed, Scott Howard is his pen name. Um, so, and we're, we're not using his photo for anonymity purposes because he is writing a ba about a topic that is um, very no-no to talk about. So, uh, this you're the you're a first time author and as a person who went to journalism school is a recovering mainstream journalist it's pretty impressive i mean it is a powerhouse premier book so i want to find out some of your motivations for even writing it um are you a christian and or a parent those would be my two first guesses uh yes to the first not yet to the second okay uh, hopefully hopefully at some point in the future when i meet the right lady okay um but um, uh, yeah, it, 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 I've kind of been uh, circling the dissident sphere for, for quite some time. And uh, I had really wanted to contribute something, but I, I didn't want to contribute something that was already being done. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I was going to be moving the dialogue forward in some capacity and, and there has been some good work done on the transgender thing but no one had gone into it uh, really into the kind of molecular level and, and really traced out you know it was mostly i was noticing there was some real good stuff that i've i've cited in in the book uh but it was getting pieces of it not the whole thing or where it was going um and, and really hadn't done much on the actual true history of it so um, it's not just a text that deals with the cultural ramifications and all of the awful things that it's, well, being allowed to do uh, and doing, um, but where it comes from and, and where it's going. Yes, and it's inescapable. Uh, I uh, call it societal sodomizing because it is uh, an assault on your sensibilities as Christians. Um, our faith, it's uh, such an inversion of um, godliness and uh, the complementary nature between men and women. So oh, it's not something you can just, um, you know, what, what's the, the old phrase was live and let live. Well, that's not what they're interested in. So uh, let, let's define a few terms before we get into some of the nuts and bolts. Um, can you define transgenderism? Well, so, so far as I've been able to, um ascertain now i'll give their definition and then mine okay uh theirs is basically an ever-changing uh at this point panoply of multitudinous made-up genders it used to be uh basically derived from the idea that there were five um and this was from this magnus hirschfeld from um, about 90 years ago in, in germany um and he basically theorized that there were five types of male though, but it was still male, female, and then it became um, transsexual, 
as far as going between one or the other. But probably in the last, oh, 10 years or so, uh, maybe a little longer, it's sort of exploded into this anything goes, um, really after um, the, the uh, gay marriage agenda was um, uh, basically accomplished. Um, my, for me, it's uh, my, I think it's, it's basically made up. I mean, not basically it is, um, which I substantiate in the text. Basically, um, there are a bunch of theories that reference, it's the same as uh, critical race theory and all these other things that people will encounter. It's uh, made up ideas, theories, uh, which are not really substantiated or are built on very faulty premises, which are then referenced by someone else as the evidence. And so the theory becomes the evidence of circular reasoning. And um, it, it's gone on this way um, adjacent to, well, race is just a construct and this is just a construct and this is just a construct. And yet at the same time, there's also these all immutable things like, well, your sexuality is fixed, but it's also fluid. Uh, you know, race is fixed, but it's also fluid. It's like, well, you know, the, 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 the point is to basically gaslight you into oblivion and just move the goalposts whenever they suit the agenda. Yes, and that's, uh, you, you do, a, I forget the name of the chapter, but you talk about the gaslighting. I think it might even be chapter two. It's right at the beginning, how this um, could not even be happening if it wasn't for just outright lies being accepted by truth by the people who adhere to them. And then of course, I guess the nice people who don't wanna be canceled or just are weak or whatever. We'll get into those people in a little bit because I think they need to stop doing those things. Um, uh, so I'm hoping your book will motivate them because um, man, the research in here, I actually in 2019 wrote quite a bit about pedophilia. You know, what are the roots of this movement? Um, I was looking more at just like LGBT in general. Um, it's personal for me. I have a trans niece, so I'm just trying to like pick it all apart. And um, yeah, there were obviously things I learned in your book that I did not know. So um, like the whole intersex thing. So an intersex person is what? A person who is born with both kinds of plumbing, but they are either biologically male or female, right? Yes, exactly. And um, I have to give credit to the, um, to the editor of the text, Maggie, for uh, providing some of the scientific basis on that that I, I kind of lack, um, but basically clarifying that issue for me, actually, uh, as I was generating that section of the book. And okay. um, what basically uh, dispels really the one great, um, I guess, biological foundation that they have um, mm -hmm. insofar as they try to uh, put forth this idea that, well, there are intersex people therefore um, right. when in fact intersex people again are not a third gender they're not not anything right. <laughs> they're male or female they just uh, it, it comes down to you know genetics and, and chromosomes and um you know these these things are um uh, you, you know there are outliers with these things and so they say well you know this person is intersex or hermaphroditic or what have you and you know therefore and it, it goes through all these distortions of the science and i mean right. we've we've just been through round one of covid uh probably going into round two here within a month or two mm -hmm. uh so we all know about bs science that's put out there i'll just blindly follow and it's always changing right right it's no different it's no different it's it's really no different the only difference in this case it's no different in terms of the arbitrary changing. The only difference is that this is a, uh, it's Genesis as a, as a social theory right. in the same way, as I said, as critical race theory. But uh, this COVID stuff is, well, it's, it's, it's adjacent to uh, what we're talking about. It does actually intersect at some points, but um, is a little bit different in the sense that that's scientism, the worship of uh, science as a religion. Uh, but it still has its own, orthodoxy in its own fictions that they put forth um, to, to shroud the agenda. Right, and its own priests and liturgy. And, you know, I guess somebody somewhere along the way changed the wording from transsexual, which implies sexuality, biological male or female, to transgender. 
and the left will just call them whatever that for uh, ease of conversation um, is very good at doing that is twisting these words and segueing from one little change or maybe adding a hyphen or something or obviously co-opting words too. Um, you know, and I, I kind of liken it to like the abortion conversation, you know, oh, the life of the mother. Well, that's a whole different ball of wax. That's a tiny percent of the population that's actually doing that, not the lion's share of women who are doing it as birth control, you know, so that's how I kind of see the intersex thing. I'm like, that's just shouldn't even be part of this huge Goliath thing that is taking us over and trying to run our lives. Um, can you define transhumanism for us? Because we're going to talk about that in a bit because you see that, and I agree, as a connection with all of this. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, transhumanism is basically the idea that uh, human beings will transcend their um, basically biology. Um, so I, I wrote a, a pair of pieces for the Occidental Observer kind of going into this agenda uh, in a little bit more detail. And I will hopefully have a book at some point coming out about it as this is kind of the next step. And as I oh. mentioned, this is how uh, COVID sort of intersects uh, with these things. But basically the idea is um, you will transcend your biology through either uh, sort of cheating death in some way, um, augmenting yourself, or possibly even becoming one with the machine and sort of uh, merging with this machine consciousness or uploading oneself, as it were, to the cloud, sort of like, um, uh, I forget the guy's name there, at the, at the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, mm -hmm. where he kind of transcends his human form because this like alien thing. It's been a while since I read it, but uh, same idea or Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, same <laughs> author, you can see a consistent theme there. But the idea is basically leaving behind the human form and the limitations of biology and becoming uh, something else, uh, something greater. When of course it's, it's um, you know, as we had, as you had mentioned uh, with Christianity, it's, it's, uh, this arrogance of creating something. And now there's this other strain that goes along with it where they're basically trying to create uh, an artificial intelligence that may well overtake us. And I know it seems very science fiction, but um, it's not. Um, you know, We're looking at all these things now in terms of uh, quantum computing strength and different things. And they're trying to get the infrastructure in there essentially to be able to leave behind uh, humanity as, as such. Um, and so the, the transhumanists, very much many of them are one and the same with the transgenders. Uh, Martine Rothblatt, who's a transgender, uh, Ray Car Kurzweil, who's written on the singularity. Uh, he has a 25-year-old uh, woman uh, avatar that he uses in digital space. So there's a lot of this very creepy, uh, quote unquote, gender bending stuff that goes on with these people. And it's really just, um, you know, in terms of sexuality, it is prelude to, uh, and in fact, oftentimes uh, directly tied into the pedophilia aspect that you mentioned, uh, but also this idea of sort of augmenting or modifying or transforming uh, one's form using science or technology or something along those lines. Which we'll um, hopefully get to this in a little bit. That all is kind of tied up with, well, very much tied up with the Great Reset and the COVID stuff. And we're not going to give uh, too much away of what's in your book, but you have to get the book to really have Scott um, bring that web of um, sinister stuff together. So, uh, uh, and oh, I'd mentioned it's uh, not available on Amazon. Where can people get it? Well, I'm thinking about it. Last I knew, you could still get it on Barnes and Noble, okay. um, but I think the best bet would be if well, if you're not in America, definitely go to Barnes and Noble, provided it's still there. It was as of a, a week or two ago, last time I checked. Okay, the shipping's a little lower. Uh, if you're in the United States, go directly to the Antelope Hill Publishing website and order it there. Okay, all right. Now, who is your target audience? I mean, are you trying to wake up people deep in the throes of hormone replacement therapy? Or do you kind of think, oh, you know, they're not reachable. I'm trying to get the people who are just trying to be nice. 
you know, like kind of wake up the masses who a, a lot of them, I mean, just honestly don't understand. They think it's loving. They think it's, you know, tolerant to, you know, put up with this stuff. And then of course the people who are just too scared to speak up, who is your target audience? Well, I, you know, I, I wrote it um, without a political uh, direction in mind. Now, obviously, as you could tell from the, the publisher and uh, maybe some of the other things I've already said that politically, you know, I'll be certainly on the right, but uh, uh, the audience that I wrote was wrote for rather uh, and intended was a wide audience. Uh, now, granted, the detail may maybe make that a little bit more uh, difficult because there is a lot of detail in that book. Um, and actually I had to trim out probably 250 pages um, and, and it's already a brick. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that's me. I get locked in on something yeah. that just, just go. Um, but I, I generally wrote with a, uh, well, general audience in mind, a regular mm -hmm. person who would go, well, where the heck did this come from all of a sudden? Why is there, you know, people with uh, dildos and you know, leather chaps parading around and it's snipers uh, protecting drag queen, drag queen story hour and, you know, Visa and MasterCard and, and uh, you know, Amazon and the NBA and whatever supporting all this stuff, you know, it, it, where the heck did this come from? And it's, it shows the progression uh, alongside uh, things like the um, so-called gay rights and feminism. And actually those really combining with each other uh, and the third vector being this sort of nebulous gender thing that was going on it really creates the monstrosity that we see before us today. Right. Um, and uh, particularly once we have, uh, you know, you break down, you break down the uh, notions of traditional roles for women uh, through feminism. Now, do I have a problem if a woman wants to go out and be the breadwinner? No. Uh, but in general, we like to, men and women generally like to hew to pretty standard roles. And, and, and that's not based on, yeah, there's some social, um, you know, uh, not pressure exactly, but uh, there's some social construction to that, to a very small point, um, which in some, which is reason, the reason why some of these things have actually had the success they've had, because there's a small nugget of truth there. But the vast majority of what we're talking about is, is biological hardwiring. Uh, due to hormonal things and all sorts of other considerations. But, uh, you know, so you take these odd examples here and there, like a Joan of Arc and say, well, you know, hey, this is uh, all women want to go and be soldiers. Well, <laughs> not really, um, nor, you know, nor are the physical capabilities uh, similar by, by any stretch. Uh, if we're talking, especially in a population level analysis. But the point is you take men and women you you demasculinize you demasculinize men. Mm -hmm. uh, you basically push women into traditionally male spheres, um, and there have actually been studies. Uh, this one in particular, I can't cite the exact study off the top of my head, but uh, it was actually found that women's uh, endogenous testosterone levels rose when they were the primary breadwinner in their family. Uh, the couples also, if they were married, had a higher incidence rate of divorce, and the couples had less sex. Uh, so you basically, you start monkeying around with nature, uh, and you start to see essentially one of the two uh, individuals mimicking the male role, even if they're not, in fact, male. Now, it's a terrible facsimile of what the actual male would be, and it, usually the relationship doesn't work out. But you could see even in these homosexual relationships, there's usually a quote unquote male and a quote unquote female that right. fill this role. So we can see here when you start pushing into nature, what happens uh, and the consequences are very obvious. You have more divorce, you have uh, higher rates of conflict and issues in the workforce because you have different competing expectations and management styles and all these different things. Uh, and you force women essentially to be tax cattle. Uh, and you, that's, that's the opening salvo in, in yeah, destroying the family. And I, I know all the oh, conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. Well, it, it's true. I mean, this right. is what the goal has been. Um, 
And so then you go and you, you, you redefine marriage, um, you know, to uh, love is love and blah, blah, blah uh, with the gay rights thing. And the second the gay rights thing, the Supreme Court puts the stamp on that, uh, the floodgates open up for the trans thing. I mean, I, as I say in the book, literally two weeks later, Bruce Jenner's on the cover of Vanity Fair and drag. <laughs> I mean, right. uh, oh, Caitlin, right? <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, but literally two weeks later. Uh, so, it, it, and as I, as I chart in the book, there was legwork being done prior to basically hand the baton off and get it into the hands of, of this whole transgender thing. Right. You know, you're describing the, the modern state of the family, I guess, if you can call it that, when there's divorces happening and, you know, single parenthood is abounding and, you know, this identity list of, you know, children don't know who they are, where they came from. Uh, you know, the white kids are taught to hate themselves and all this kind of thing. And it's like, wow, it's almost like it was by design. And um, it was, and that's not a conspiracy theory. And I think your book um, touches on the, uh, the anti-white aspects of the whole transgender industrial complex. Can you talk about some of that? Like, um, is it all just part of the same beast kind of moving down the track or did they kind of lump that on because they, they thought it was an easy sell with it? Uh, how did all this occur? Well, so far as I've been able to figure, uh, it all appears to be just another arm of this thing. Okay. Um, but I would say that uh, there is this uh, ideology of intersectionality, which a lot of listeners will be familiar with. Um, and it, this makes for a very useful marrying of otherwise kind of strange bedfellows. Right. Um, but the goal is, of course, to break down all of society. And it's particularly pronounced, obviously, in the West, um, where this for various reasons. I don't want to get your show shut down, so I won't get too far into it. Uh, there has been um, a concerted effort to make Western societies multicultural, uh, so to speak. The breaking down and atomization of people, this is another vector. Uh, but if you have people beat down and demoralized and hating themselves and essentially not reproducing. I mean, this is another way also to, to get people to not reproduce in these groups. Now, again, going back to biology, there are very clear indications that certain population groups are more or less receptive to this agenda. Uh, if you look at incidence rates of homosexuality, which I do discuss in the book, uh, whites actually have the lowest percentage. Uh, and so the propaganda needs to be turned up the highest. Uh, in those contexts. Um, Wait, and, and that was the lowest case of homosexuality or transgenderism? Uh, both. Interesting. Um, okay, I, I missed that. Okay. Yes. That was just um, transgenderism. I, I believe for um, homosexuality was uh, uh, maybe it was half that of the black, something like that. Um, but yes, so so there's a lot less receptivity to that. There's also a, a far more robust tradition of not allowing for authoritarianism. Um, you know, we can sort of scoff at democracy and, and these ideas, you know, with the sham they've become, or maybe we're always meant to be, but this idea that we accept, we, we advocate for, or even rebel against, or push for limits on power is much more pronounced uh, in the West, and we also have a much more individualistic streak. Now, they use certain biological predispositions to tailor the propaganda. They've been using Africa as a testing ground, as a lab, uh, as I cover uh, fairly late in the book, but uh, as basically a, a, a testing ground for these a lot of these things for a long time. They have been. Uh, now, they don't really need to do the whole multicultural thing in Africa because it's already been blown up into pieces from uh, not just uh, long, very long story short, it's sort of reverting back to pre-colonial uh, times where you have different tribal factions and all of these things. But there's a lot of artifice that's gone along with these fake countries that were made out of colonies and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's already basically a multicultural disaster. Uh, so they don't need to fracture 
uh, say, Nigeria, the way they have to do it to France, because France has a unified ethnic identity, a cultural sense of itself, and has a long tradition for better or often worse, rebelling against authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. um, I say often worse because the French Revolution was a disaster. Uh, I will say, however, the French have a lot more backbone than people give them credit for. They've been out protesting vaccine mandates for some time now, which the mainstream media does not cover, the yellow vests, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but they, it's not necessary for them to do that for many of these other countries, which are already broken and impoverished. Right. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of factors um, at play here. The ultimate aim, of course, is to have basically uh, what Kerry Bolton calls the homo globicus, uh, the sort of vaguely lefty sort of hive person that is at home in any one of these metropolitan areas across the globe. It doesn't matter if it's you know, Melbourne, Australia, New York City, London, whatever. Uh, this is this kind of any, uh, <laughs> I think John Stewart of all people made the joke in, in one of it, in the book, America, that kind of fake textbook he wrote. He said, some of the effect that in the future, everybody's going to look like Vin Diesel. Um, and, I, and that <laughs> yeah, is right. kind of what they're going for, actually. <laughs> Um, so that yeah <laughs> yeah i don't see the vin diesels out and about in the lgbt movement uh, mm. we'll see i don't know um <laughs> anyway uh but i'm a very much a uh southern without apology stalwart and i see it also as an anti-southern thing um so let me tell you my theory um Anti-white is very much uh, an anti-Southern thing because they see white, the white Christian male oppressor as being very much the root of all problems, right? The scapegoat for everything. If he can be done away with, with his superstitions and his backwardness, yada, 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 you know, they would all have, you know, be singing Kumbaya or whatever. Well, that is why, to me, the, the statues, the monuments are coming down. It's not, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with slavery. That's just an excuse. It's because they were Christian people who stood up to the centralized state. They were overwhelmingly localist people who did not want to be told what to do and were very, a very agrarian people. They were close to the earth and didn't want crazy old Yankee industrialism shoved down their throats. And you know, you even see it with COVID stuff where the media is always railing against the rural Appalachians and how they haven't all gotten the jab and yeah, yeah, you know, it's always like the dumb Appalachians and the Hicks and yeah, you know, they're, they're stopping everybody from being COVID free. Um, I just see anti-white and anti-Southern as very synonymous. Do you, you're a homesteader. Do you see anything with that? The whole, you know, pulling away from the natural and the local and, you know, obviously lauding the technocratic and global and the malleable person that doesn't have to be an authentic individual, but can be an any man or any woman or any Z, whatever they're called. Uh, I mean, do you see any anything to that, especially as a homesteader? Oh, a a absolutely. I mean, eventually they do uh, want to take away the, the ability of people to produce their own food, because as Henry Kissinger once said, if you control the food, you control the people. Right. Uh, so we, you know, any rural American is is enemy number one now rural and white is pretty much synonymous yes yeah, that's uh, i would more say or less. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so that also goes along with that kind of independent streak um you know the firearms ownership and the desire to defend oneself and the understanding through hard work um that there are physical limitations and understanding the limitations of our bodies and what they can do and cannot do uh, all these things this the average city person uh, does not understand and so it's very easy for them to live in delusion. Their food basically magically appears on a shelf somewhere. They get it or it's delivered to them or whatever, uh, or they drink it, the soil and green or whatever the, whatever the hell they're, they're doing now. And, uh, you know, for them, it's all magic. It all works. It's all great. Uh, but a, a lot of it is also late stage decadent decline. I mean, this whole idea of parading about with, you know, dildos and whatever i mean it's all this uh you know uh, it's a country that's just dead i mean it's it's finished 
Um, but but it's more than that too. I mean, so that's a natural consequence of any kind of empire and its de- in its death throes is just this decadent ridiculousness. Uh, and, and the more preposterous their preoccupations, the more serious you know the threats to its existence. And, uh, that's that's all very obvious to anyone paying attention. That, that's a factor among many. Uh, but to go back to what you were saying, connecting with the empire, yes, I think the civil war is about holding together the territorial integrity of what is not a country, but an empire. Um, and so you have very different cultures. Uh, you know, Colin Woodward has written this with American nations and um, Albion Seed before that. There's a few other books which cover this, that there's really a, a multitude of nations in the United States. Uh, so should the United States break apart, uh, you'd have at least four sovereign nations uh, come out of it, most likely, were things to proceed naturally. Uh, but the South, in the same way that South Africa uh, and Rhodesia were targeted for oblivion, and I referenced Kerry Bolton earlier, he's written very, very well on this topic about how any kind of apartheid system, which was meant to preserve the ethnic identity of the group instituting this, uh, provided they were white. I mean, they don't seem to have a problem with it, with a caste system in India, for example, mm-hmm. uh, is targeted for oblivion, mostly due, in his estimation, for free trade considerations and cheap labor. Now, there's also the, the obvious anti-white agenda, which uh, all one needs to do is look into, let's say, the affiliations, uh, shall we say, of most of the Biden administration's uh, ethnic background. Um, I'm trying to be a little cagey about this. <laughs> uh, I invite the listener to do their research uh, and see the antagonism that they have toward the usual, uh, uh, as far as the environments that they found themselves in, uh, particularly in Europe and in the West, the majority that they sur- find themselves surrounded by, uh, and the ability um, through different means to kind of break that open and try to facilitate this idea of multiculturalism. Uh, Kevin McDonald is a great source to go look at for that. Um, what we're talking about here is, yeah, the idea of a very different culture in the South, a much more honor-based, uh, almost medieval, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean it in terms of chivalry, uh, in terms of uh, religiosity and a lot of these other things, which the North really has lost itself. Um, you know, it really, it began as something very special, I think, with the Mayflower and this idea of what it could be. Uh, but it sort of lost itself and became something very universalist, which I think is a problem with Christianity in general. Uh, when it was working, it was really working in a particular way, uh, particularly in the high Middle Ages, which gave Europe a sense of itself. And I think that in the South, you see it much more so than, uh, and to a lesser extent in the Midwest, much more of that than in other parts of the country. Uh, and I think that this imperialist project uh, was designed to destroy this apartheid and really, really conquer uh, the South um, and subjugate it. And I think that we see, yeah, even today, I mean, look, I, I, the Republican Party is a joke. You have the Alabama governor out there. You have uh, the guy from Arkansas. These people, uh, they're, they're all of them hammering. Oh, we've got to get vaccinated. You're killing people, blah, 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 blah. They're lockstep with the Democrats. If, there's any, if anyone's harboring any illusions that these guys are in opposition, I mean, come on. It's hand in glove. So even the people who are supposedly representing the interests of their own uh, are not. And so the idea is, yeah root out any resistance to this project and it's generally the same people who are against the jab who are also uh against this uh let's call it the whole trans thing uh pushing it in the schools pushing it uh and and you can see that there's something real sick about it because they're going uh i I highlight a couple of instances in the book where they're even talking about two and three-year-olds uh, and, you know, there, there is no conversation in my world to be had about anything to do with gender or sexuality or anything with a two or a three-year-old, yeah. period. 
but they want to get him young. They want to brainwash him. And yeah, it goes into, I, I hate to say, but it's true. Uh, they want to go into the pedophilia aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why when my niece, it was, gosh, it was 2019. I read these. I mean, I guess she, the deal with her was she was depressed, uh, you know, the product of divorce, whatever. Um, you know, she went, she was thinking maybe she was a lesbian, you know, all these kinds of things, depressed, sad, thinking she was a lesbian. Well, she goes to a psychologist that my sister paid for and by God, you know, well, she is miserable and sad because she really thinks she's a boy. So this kind of thing. So, um, you know, I get upset about these things with my family who I love dearly, but I've had falling outs with some of them because many of them want to stick their fingers in their ear. And I'm like, this is not only good for her, we will call her Katie, um, but this is not good for my children either. You know, my children, I am the mother of three boys and she is not a boy. She will never go through what they go through. She will never be expected to do anything they're expected to, to do. Uh, she will never have the experiences. You know, the left is always like, oh, you know, a white person can't write about the experiences of people of color. Well, okay, whatever. I'll take that and I'll raise you one and I'll say, neither can a girl pretend to have the experiences of my biological sons, you know? And um, it's just, it's so crazy to me because, you know, people are allowing this to happen. It's like, I, I talk about feminism sometimes. I was a, I got a minor in women's studies. I'm a recovering feminist and all this. And, you know, we can give women a lot of blame with feminism, but it was only allowed to happen because men allowed it to happen. This is our time where we tell the trans people to metaphorically go in the kitchen and make us a sandwich because we're done with this. No moss, we're done. It stops here. And I just don't know how many people are going to have to be hurt forever by this spiritually, physically, you know, in the short term, you know, it, it's just, it's crazy to me how anti-male and anti-boy this is. And you were talking about, you know, sh the chivalric uh, nature of the South and stuff. And yeah, I think that's part of it too, that, uh, you know, I think you were alluding to this earlier that men are typically... It, white western men typically in the south whatever the archetype is guys from nebraska like you you know strong manly men are the people to resist this kind of stuff and if you want to get rid of those people or scare them into submission because of cancel culture i mean it's just i don't understand why good people can't see that <laughs> um uh, do you i mean uh, do you think most people just buy along because they want to stick their fingers in the ears, which is what I think part of my family members want to do. They just don't want to see it. Like I would send them pictures of phalloplasty, like, hey, is she going to do this? Let me show you what it looks like. It's horrifying. I know everything about it. Let me show it to you and tell you why we shouldn't let this happen. Oh, I can't look at it. It's so gross and horrifying. I'm like, yeah, it is gross and horrifying. Can we have a conversation? But people just don't want to have conversations anymore. And I mean, are you having conversations with people about this or is it well, so anonymous that it's not bridging into your world? Well, I, I do. Um, I do. And people are generally um, not particularly receptive to what I have to say. And I think that it's, it has to go along with that um, idea of, yeah, we don't want to stare into the abyss. We don't want to see this you know, stuff, it's out of sight, out of mind, but uh, people have just been beat down and, yeah. and cowed. And I, I've seen it uh, with the vaccine stuff. And I use vac the term vaccine very loosely um, for this mRNA crap. Uh, but the idea is basically just wear everybody down. It's one of these long, it, it's the same reason if, if the listeners wondering, like, why haven't they just they clearly want control, right? Why didn't they just take over, uh, you know, at gunpoint a hundred years ago <clears throat> and, and just say, well, it's ours now uh, because people would fight back. It's got to be the, the frog boiling in the pot. Uh, now, there are a lot of things going on here. I mean, there is the, the demasculinization through uh, shaming through, I mean, there are environmental factors um, that are lowering testosterone of males. Uh, it's diet. There's all this, you know, 
plastics and BPA and all these other things, environmental factors that biologically push it down. Um, the disruption of normal male-female relations uh, that, we, that I mentioned can, can cause some havoc. I mean, there's a lot of things. But the idea is basically slowly just just crush, crush, crush. Uh, in the same way, the, the European, uh, for the, the countries in, in Europe and Asia that were under the USSR, just have uh, really never recovered uh, from, from being just slowly strangled of any sort of hope. And, that, and that's what they're trying to do. Um, and, and you can see the mask slip um, in different period, periodically about all the treacly sort of liberalist platitudes. They use them to disguise what they want. I mean, it's like this Cuomo, uh, the governor of New York saying, you know, if you're a healthcare worker, you're getting vaccinated, period. Uh, then he deletes his tweet and he says, oh, you know, we need to find a kind and compassionate way to vaccinate everybody. It's like, well, no, the, the idea is we're going to make it so you can't earn a living if you don't go along with the project. And that's the cancel culture. That's the vaccine mandates. It's all the stuff. You, you need to be on board 100%. Or, or you're finished. And, and it's going to be done in such a way that you can't eat. You can't, I mean, because look, if you can't get money, they've instituted property tax. You can't pay your property tax. You can't own a home. You can't own property. Uh, they, that it's this, none of this is an accident. I mean, they've created a system that wants to hem you in and enslave you. Um, and this is precisely what, what the goal is. Um, but anyway, do, do I have these conversations? Yes. Uh, sorry, I get sidetracked a little bit. Um, <laughs> do, yes, I have the conversations with people. Um, generally, they seem to be very receptive to the stuff about hands off the kids. Right. Uh, other than that, um, people are a bit more ambivalent and are sort of, well, what does it matter if, you know, uh, like literally every company is doing the rainbow stuff? And it's like, well, because... Uh, it trickles down and it creates a certain culture and they create the ability to infiltrate these disciplines. It's the same thing with the psychoanalysis, these different theories, these mental, uh, getting into the mental faculties of people and the, and the way that they think. Um, they, they've accomplished this with psychoanalysis, with uh, anthropology. I mean, uh, again, I reference Kevin McDonald reading the culture of critique. I would highly recommend for the, the listeners because they'll see exactly how this was done in those fields. And so how is psychology co-opted and how do they remove, uh, you know, or how do they change this gender identity disorder to dysphoria? And I'm sure they'll remove it in the next diagnostic manual. Uh, and they basically push this stuff and of course social media as well and these different things which basically recruit and groom the kids uh it's in the schools and it seeps in and it's the same thing it's just sort of the long march through the institutions uh as each one is co-opted and falls under the sway of this agenda which is the the trans thing is but one facet of it it is uh probably the most destructive it's certainly the most disturbing to date uh, but it is of a piece uh, as they want to sort of deracinate and create everyone as a rootless individual who can be sort of moved wherever they need to be like a widget um, and plugged in eventually to this internet of things that the, that the reset people are all about. Uh, and that goes removing you from the production of your own food, mm -hmm. removing you from any kind of actual uh, real world experience, which would remind you of, Oh, I have limitations. Oh, I need to uh, do certain things, uh, doing and failing or doing and succeeding, whatever, but actually doing it will mm -hmm. show you where your limitations are. And it is a rude slap in the face or a cold glass of water splashed in the face to any delusion you have of having to actually do it. I could envision myself to be the strongest man in the world. If I go and try to lift the boulder, I can't do it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I identify as a billionaire, so there you go. <laughs> well, good, and you don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> That's right, win-win. But this kind of, um, what the words you were just using, the way you were explaining it, again, it kind of reminds me of 
the war on the South and as a person who has Confederate ancestors. And like, to me, you know, I used to cry when every monument came down now, I'm just like, I know what's happening, but it's very much an attack on the rootless, not just the little Orthodox Christian roots of the South, but the very tight knit kith and kin relationships of the South that were, it's not what do you do, it's where you're from. That, that's very much still a question in the South. They ask you maybe what you do second or third, but it's where you're from. Those are important things. But if you're rootless and identityless, you don't know who your his, what your history is or you're being taught to hate it, it just feeds into that. And um, it's interesting, my sister who has the trans kids, she's all sad about the monuments. She's sad that they wanna take down the monument <laughs> In Richmond, on you know, they've taken almost all of them down except for Robert E. Lee and uh, on Monument Avenue. And for some reason, she's very sentimental. So I think that's what her deal is. It's just a thing to her. She's used to it, and she doesn't know why. She's not stupid, but she's not like a history buff like me. And um, she just knows that she doesn't want it to come down. And I, if she would have conversations with me about these things, I would try to connect the dots for her and tell her it's all the same thing. That, that statue coming down is just like the psychologist telling her daughter that she's a boy. It's all the same thing. Well, speaking of connecting the dots, uh, let's talk about, first of all, sort of connecting the dots, debunking a couple myths, and then we'll get into connecting the dots. Um, yeah, so the epidemic of trans violence. I mean, you hear that all the time. Tell us, uh, is that a true thing? Right. I mean, yeah. I think Leading that's one question. Of the first, right. Yeah, right. Uh, I mean, that's one of the first things in the book that I, uh, I just get right into debunking some of these things and saying, you know, this idea that somehow there's this epidemic of violence. I mean, it's a joke. Uh, you know, I think the the homicide uh, rate for trans people um, is maybe a quarter of the general population. If, uh, I can't quite remember the figures from the book, but uh, you know, you're four times more likely as just a regular Joe to get killed than if you're a transgender person. So it's, it's a complete, complete lie. Wow. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm bringing it back to the South one more time. I was in Atlanta recently, uh, it was back in February, and we were at a, a, a cemetery that had, you know, all sorts of old graves, like Margaret Mitchell was buried there. Well, everything was all spray painted and all this, you know, there were tarps on things, Nazi this, Nazi that, it was insane. In February, I'm assuming this was from like, you know, the summer of 2020. So anyway, um, on this big obelisk, it said, protect black trans women, you know, on this obelisk to Confederate <laughs> veterans. And my best friend said, you know, who's hurting black trans women? And I said, no, tell me. She said, black men. And I said, you're right. But yet it is, um, you know, dead Confederate, you know, it's Robert E. Lee's fault or whatever, you know, it's insane. <laughs> Okay, I said, uh, sorry, I went off on a tangent. Um, what about, um, this isn't really a myth, but the going from a disorder to dysphoria, um, you know, that mental health profession kind of coaching kids from something that was considered, I guess, to the 19, I don't even know when, you would know when, but, but that there was something wrong with them, with their brain, with their cognitive abilities, uh, or their wiring, but now it's dysphoria. Um, is that just sleight of hand there? Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, it's it's the same, um, you know, as I mentioned, I believe that with the next one, I'm sure they'll just get rid of it altogether. But yeah, the, the constant redefinition of terms um, and to go from, you know, you hear all the, the buzzwords, oh, you don't want to stigmatize people and blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, do people who have obsessive compulsive disorder you know do they have obsessive compulsive dysphoria uh or is it a, is it something that is just not quite right in their head and i don't mean that in an in insulting or derogatory right. way i mean it as something is people need to seek treatment uh for these irregularities in the way that they perceive the world the way their thought process is uh, i'm not saying we need to like re-educate people people at re-education camps anything like that obviously uh, what I'm saying is that there is a generally what we would consider normal psychological profile mm -hmm. of a person. And this person generally understands uh, reality and their personal reality corresponds roughly to the external reality. There's always going to be some degree of 
self-deception and, and et cetera, but they don't perceive themselves to be something other than what they are. They don't, a man doesn't think he's a woman. Uh, there, this is probably one of the most extreme cases uh, of, of, a, of a disorder where one in fact believes that they are born in the wrong body, but it's the same thing as a phantom limb. It's the same thing as any kind of neurological disorder where a person's thought process is not aligning with what we would again consider to be normal. So yeah, it's, it is, it is a disorder. And, it, and I'm again, not saying this in a derogatory way. Uh, now there, this is to be differentiated, of course, from many, many people who have simply just been brainwashed or convinced that they are trans. Right. Uh, probably the vast majority, in fact, not probably, the, the mass, vast majority of the individuals who are identifying as trans or non-binary or what have you have been either brainwashed or pressured socially where they believe they're going to get some kind of a benefit. And actually, this is where the anti-white thing ties in as well, because if you're a white individual, particularly a white male, well, how do you become... Uh, go from oppressor to oppressed. Well, you're trans. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. And there's there's also the uh, sort of like with, um, you know, this is kind of a dark topic, but like with suicides, they tend to cluster. Same idea, same phenomenon has been witnessed with transgenderism. Um, so there are all of these factors at play. The actual number of people who believe that they are born in the wrong body is a very negligible amount. And those are people that have a neurological disorder and they need treatment. They don't need to be told, yeah, you're right, and given all of these treatments uh, and everything else, when at, at the end of the day, they've been sold a bill of goods. And actually, the suicide rate for these people is like 40-something percent after, the, after, after they've gotten these so-called sex change operations. Because they've been told that solves their problems. Well, it doesn't. They still have unresolved psychological issues and the one thing they pinned their let's call it their salvation to and you know by the way you notice how they're always railing against conversion therapy mm -hmm. that's what they're doing mm -hmm. they're saying well you're actually a woman you're actually a man no you're not <laughs> so we say we will act we will convert you we will change you using hormones using all this other stuff we will make you something else and when they get to the other side of that bridge they discover psychologically they're in at least as bad of a place as they were when they started. And now there are normally, and this is not just transgenderism, this is actually also homosexuality. There are usually attendant psychological disorders that go along with them. So it's usually not just, I have borderline personality disorder, uh, or as, excuse me, I'm not usually just trans, quote unquote. I also have borderline personality disorder. There's a lot of different things. A lot of it also stems from the fact that many homosexuals have been abused, um, and that is what creates many, not all, but many of the homosexual population insofar as I've been able to figure from the research. Uh, it's not something that's really looked into because it's taboo, but in the scant evidence that I've been able to find, yeah, a lot of this stems from abuse, and there's a lot of uh, psychological trauma that's bound up in all of this. And it's difficult to parse some of it out, but there are usually attendant disorders that go along with these things as well. We're talking about a very uh, troubled segment of the population who need real treatment and are not, uh, the worst thing you can do for them is, is basically provide conversion therapy and then weaponize them against the rest of the population. But that's precisely what the people in power are doing because they're sick. Yeah, and weaponize is just just the right word for it. And uh, you know, your your research, the statistics you lay out, um, I mean, it's just phenomenal. I, I think this book can reach some people who uh, I'm going to buy it for many of the people in my family. <laughs> I don't know if well, I'm gonna buy. You. I don't know if I'm gonna buy it for my sister, who is the parent of my trans niece, because I don't think she would read it. But I think other people would, who kind of play along with the game because they think Katie's fragile and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, no shit, she's fragile. I mean, come on, you know. I'm like, we're just like, not we. They're just kind of snowballing the problem here. But uh, 
Yeah. I mean, how long did this research take you? What did you say? 18 months? Uh, yeah, probably took me about 18 months. Um, now, to be fair, I had a uh, good friend of mine who was also talking about doing a trans book, basically say, hey, you look like you're doing it better. Here's what I have. Nice. So that kind of gave me a lot of, uh, 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 gave me some help uh, quite a bit. And of course, uh, uh, Maggie, the editor, really helped bring it all together as well. Um, you know, I tend to not be so great at always explaining the big picture. I tend to get lost in the details. And so she helped me basically explain, uh, create good transitions and, and put in uh, aspects that would basically explain the significance of certain things and kind of give it a little bit more coherence. So I definitely had help. Um, but I would say, yeah, the it, all told, it probably took me about 18 months and it was, uh, you know, a very, uh, it was very difficult, actually, um, not necessarily in terms of effort and time, which it, which it was, but I, I, um, I don't want to say I enjoyed it, uh, but I felt like I had to do it. But it was learning this really uh, and, and seeing all these things really put a lot of miles on my soul, I guess I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love researching stuff. That's why um, I don't crank out blogs every single day, that and being a mom and you know, a dog owner and a wife and all that kind of stuff too. But uh, yeah, I, I go down these rabbit holes and then, oh my gosh, all of a sudden I've got a five part series or something, or I'm working on something that's not going to be ready tomorrow. It's going to be ready in a month or whatever, because you want to do it just right. And I don't want to scare people who are listening and think, oh, a book with a bunch of data and statistics, boring. No, I mean, it is, it's very readable. It's very, re I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to put it down. I'm telling you, you're not going to be able to put it down. Um, and then there's just stuff that, you know, you find out like, so for example, the whole Cincinnati Children's Hospital that they're like these pioneer perverts. Um, that's a particular thing to me that's sad because um, I had um, twin to twin transfusion syndrome when I was uh, pregnant with my twins and we had to go to Cincinnati to get experimental fetoscopic laser surgery to save my children's lives. So like without that hospital, because it was deemed experimental at the time, it's not anymore that surgery, but um, they did God's work there. I mean, my children would not be there without, without them. And then just to find out that they're doing this crazy sinister trans stuff too, oh, it just, it's, it's heart wrenching, you know? I mean, you're supposed to be saving lives, not experimenting on people. Um, it's, you just uncover, you know, just all these nuggets as you're reading it, even for people who think they know a lot about this issue. I mean, your book just really, um, parses out, teases out the whole like systemic revolution of it all, the, the weaponized bureaucratic, educational, judicial, just the whole thing, you know, this web of interconnectivity is just amazing. So can we talk a little bit about, um, what I heard you call on one podcast as the mother load of wrong think. Can we go down? The <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, now you have to refresh my memory of what exactly I said was the mother load of wrong thing. Well, the whole topic in general, but the fact that um, it seems to me that this is a uh, unmistakably, um, uh, we'll say secular Jewish people are heavily involved in this industry. Ah, okay. I, I wasn't sure if we would be uh, able to talk about that or not. Uh. Well, I'm going to talk <laughs> okay. about because it, it uh, well, I, I had read reviews of your book and I knew that it was going to be in there, but it, I think you even have it in your introduction. So I'm like, well, it's in his introduction. We're going to talk about it. I have Jewish friends. It's all good. Um, well, let me tell you a Dennis Prager quote before we go down this road, because I think this is important. Um, so Dennis Prager and like a book TV interview from like 2012 or something, a caller asked him about the revolutionary spirit of Jews. Since Dennis Prager is Jewish, somebody asked him that on book TV. I guess you can't do that anymore, but they did this back like a decade ago. And he says, when Jews left Judaism, so we're specifying secular Jews, not practicing Jews. When Jews left Judaism, they stayed religious. But the religion they affirm is any form of leftism, secular ideologies. Marxism is secular messianism, many people call it. Um, most of the pro-communist press outside of the USSR was the American Yiddish press. 
And then he says some other stuff. And then at the end, he says, Jews love isms. Jews are to isms like we're talking about obviously now transgenderism, anti-racism, feminism, etc. Jews are to isms what Italians are to operas. <laughs> so I'm just well, quoting a Jewish man, folks. He said it. <laughs> well, I mean, you I mean, you're not wrong. Oh, uh, yeah, th that that's one aspect of it. I I uh, depending on the audience, I'll either explicitly get into or not. I mean, I certainly explicitly get into it in the book. Um, but yeah, it, it just like, uh, as I mentioned with anthropology, um, uh, just like, as I mentioned with, um, psychology, uh, those predominantly secular Jews or, uh, philo Semites, uh, such as Margaret Mead, you know, with anthropology and she had, some, uh, I can't remember if it's in this book or the, the manuscript for the next one I've got going out. Sorry <laughs> to get a little confused, but, uh, uh, get into this whole milieu of, uh, the cold critical theory thing. Right. Um, it's the same idea. Um, and in fact, the, the genesis of the whole trans thing really gets in, really goes to the in Institute for um, Sexology in Weimar, Germany, which is Magnus Hirschfeld. Uh, and most of those individuals were in fact Jewish. Um, and the critical theory, which is where critical race theory and these other things come from, uh, were predominantly Jews who had gone to um, Colombia in the, in the mid thirties and, and basically proceeded to uh, conquer other disciplines. Now there were other Marxists uh, active uh, or pseudo Marxists in the, in those fields prior. Uh, and there were other Jews active in those fields prior, but the 1930s is really the, the watermark uh, or the watershed, actually, I should say the watershed of uh, this activity. And um, what we see is that actually uh, uh, Hirschfeld his institute is actually burned to the ground uh, because of all the, the weird perversity that was going on there and sort of early versions of uh, sex changes. And they tried to implant a uterus in some guy and he died and weird, really weird stuff. And uh, what ends up happening is yes, it, it basically gets its genesis through that. And it's the same thing with feminism and uh, the, the homosexual um, agenda as well. It, it is led primarily uh, or disproportionate, either primarily or disproportionately by um, secular Jews and uh, what, yeah, whether that be communism or uh, the whole LGBTQ, AEIOU, I call it, um, thing. Yeah, it's there and it's inescapable. And actually that was probably the initial attack on the book was led by actually someone I mentioned in the book, I don't think they had read it, uh, Heron Greensmith, who uh, basically inadvertently kind of made it pseudo viral on Twitter back before I got banned uh, of that too, um, saying basically all oh, this, he said the un, un uh, I, I think she assumed my pronouns by saying uh, he, uh, that take umbrage to that. But anyway, uh, just kidding. Um, but basically they said, uh, you know, oh, they said, the, he said the unnamed, the unsayable thing or whatever it was. And, um, the point there is, well, look, the book identifies the facts. I am not making a disproportionate share of Jews be responsible for this. They're doing it. I'm just pointing it out. Uh, in fact, you know, it, it, what can I say other than it is what it is? And yes, I think it goes into this, uh, this spirit. And I think that, um, well, the Prager quote's very illustrative and, and uh, I've mentioned Kevin McDonald a few times, but he does a lot of work on that basically as a psychological phenomenon. It's the same reason you'll see uh, Jews very heavily involved in promoting open borders for the West. Uh, a lot of it is also, of course, antagonism. Uh, and you could classify that as a psychological thing, but it, I think it's probably something deeper. Uh, antagonism towards uh, white Christians in general. Right. Um, and I think that it's this, uh, if you look into the, the pornography industry, for example, you'll find this, uh, this, I, uh, this intentional undermining. Uh, and this very strange, uh, you know, I talk about this quite a bit in the book, this very strange conflation amongst many of the Jews with Judaism itself being queer. Uh, in, in fact, th this is stated by numerous people, and I quote them in the book. These aren't just things I'm throwing out there because I don't like certain people or something. No, not at all. I, I don't like the fact that people are doing this, uh, regardless of what their religion or race is. Um, but what I'm saying is that you'll find 
the vast majority of the sources in there, I quote the people themselves. I go straight to the horse's mouth and I say, look, this is what these people are saying. Uh, and so there's a very large proportion of individuals that you'll find. It's you just, if you notice patterns, you cannot escape it. It's all there. Uh, and you know, it's being criticized, uh, in some quarters for saying, well, you've identified, uh, you know, figures X through X, Y, Z as Jewish. Well, okay, but we need to dig into that and, and investigate, well, what's going on here? What exactly is going on here with this phenomenon? And it, you'll find the same thing with transhumanism. I mentioned Ray Kurzweil. I mentioned Martin Rothblatt. They're Jewish. Uh, the vast majority of the leading figures in transhumanism are either Jewish or homosexual. Peter Thiel is another example. Uh, so you will continue, who's homosexual. Uh, not sure if he's Jewish. I don't. Uh, I don't believe he if, uh, he is officially, but he's got sort of an Ashkenazic look. But anyway, whether he is or is not, the point is you will find a very large proportion of individuals from this school of finding the new ism, uh, be they going from what you said with Prager, or a lot of homosexuals or transgenders themselves pushing these things, pushing the transhumanist technological uh, singularity sort of fusion thing as well. Uh, Tim Gill is another figure I mentioned. Um, and you'll also find it a very large intersection with the medical industrial complex, um, such as when you, if you start digging into the University of San Francisco or uh, where, by the way, once again, most of the practitioners uh, of their whole trans clinic or what have you, Jewish, um, or you dig into Johns Hopkins, which of course is instrumental in the coronavirus agenda through all of the quote unquote official statistics coming from Johns Hopkins. If you notice, that's where all the numbers of the uh, dead and infected are coming from. Uh, and indeed many of even the very early uh, experiments and things going on with the transgender aspect uh, can trace their genesis to Johns Hopkins as well. So both historically and now currently. Um, so if you, if the listeners are at all familiar with event 201, uh, which was sort of the tabletop exercise of running a pandemic in October, 2019, uh, you'll find Johns Hopkins, which is also again, instrumental to the transgender thing. So connecting these dots, I, if I may segue um, somewhat, you have this idea of using the intersection of these different things to implement the next uh, phase essentially in the agenda, which dovetails with the transhumanism, the internet of things, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, the great reset, many people are probably familiar with, which involves of course, control of food supply, getting everything online into the internet of things uh, and all of that. Yeah, and you know, just the fact we're talking about this, it's okay, right? We're intellectually curious people. Uh, patterns are okay; they're explanations. Um, you know, I, I think that if these were Chinese people, oh my gosh, you know, everybody in America would be like losing their minds because China's creating this on us. Or, good lord, could you imagine if it was the Russians behind all of this? Oh, you know. I mean, if it was white Christian men doing this, you'd never hear the end of it, right? I mean, this is just talking honestly about who is behind what's happening and in, in trying to parse it out and like, why is this a thing? And, uh, you know, I think it was Solzhenitsyn who said you couldn't understand Bolshevism without understanding the Jewish component. Um, and, you know, I if you understand cultural Marxism, and I haven't studied it as much as other people, but probably more than the average bear, I mean, the whole point of cultural Marxism that conservatives are always railing against and Turning Point USA is, you know, gets, oh, we got to stop the cultural Marxists. Well, the whole point of it was to destroy white Christian society. I got that from Paul Gottfried, who happens to be a very smart Jewish man, you know, um, the Holocaust industry that was coined, that term was coined by Shlomo Sand a professor at Tel Aviv University. I mean, I think that honest people can have these conversations and it's okay. You know, it, it's just um, an exercise and in intellectual inquiry, inquiry. And we want to know why the Frankfurt School 
again, conservatives are always railing against the Frankfurt School. But as you pointed out, it was predominantly secular Jews who went to Columbia University. And um, I think your book does, again, a really, uh, really great um, job of kind of connecting that web. And, um, you know, I think it's important. And I hope that us talking about that doesn't scare readers away because it's just a fact and facts are not scary things. Uh, I do not think. Um, well, let's talk a little bit. Uh, we'll start wrapping it up here because um, our time is almost up. Let's talk a little bit more about um, children being used as guinea pigs. Um, and the sex ed is like the transhumanist indoctrination and the age of consent, how that's being equated to equity issues and stuff. Um, the, the whole children aspect of this uh, is that brand new and is that they're just pushing too hard too fast like progressives do do that sometimes they push too hard and then there's reaction from it is is that what's happening here or do they just think people are ripe for this uh, I think that there is probably they're probably going a little bit too hard on that um, it, it, with the Institute for Sexology uh, they did have youths go and tour their so-called museum. But the emphasis was generally on adults. Um, it's really only been relatively recently, I would say, that there's been a, a concerted effort to target children. Now, if you start to scratch the surface on the homosexual, particularly male homosexual culture, you'll find there's a whole lot of underage grooming that goes on. Uh, that's a Milo Yiannopoulos got in trouble for basically admitting to this fact, but it is true um, that that happens. So there has always been that element there. Um, but as far as actually going in, there are seeds. OK, so if you go back to the USSR in the in the 1920s, uh, when it was the uh, institutional framework of the USSR was predominantly dominated by, once again, uh, secular Bolshevik Jews, uh, there was an emphasis on teaching promiscuity in the school. So there was a sort of sexuality component, not necessarily transgenderism as such, but uh, there were so-called researchers from the USSR who went and visited Hirschfeld's Institute and they compared notes. Uh, so there is some overlap there. And then in terms of some of the anthropology aspects, talking about sexual precocity uh, and having multiple partners and things like that. So there are seeds of this that have been there for a while. A uh, hundred years, at least. Um, however, uh, the emphasis on like trans kids and all of this, probably ten years, I would say, roughly so, as far as really digging into this and really targeting youth, particularly like children. Um, and I think that once you once they had this big victory, and, and um, as I talk about in the book. The key to the um, so-called gay rights triumph was messaging and branding. And once they hit on love is love, it was the master stroke. I mean, that's what did it. Now that is perfectly broad enough to now be applied to all sorts of things, right? right. Um, but what, again, it, it's, it's not that it wasn't there. I mean, um, I mentioned, uh, I can't remember the name of the organization, but they had connections to NAMBLA the North American Man Boy Love Association, mm -hmm. uh, and were actually, of all, the UN, like, kicked them out of having consultative status, the UN, which is like the den of, <laughs> the den of vipers, of all places. Uh, so, so it's been there. Uh, it's been sort of on the periphery, and it's had some intersection, but uh, that really kind of put it into overdrive, and um, that the, the triumph of the Obama administration was really the culmination of a lot of this uh, cultural Marxism that had been in the works for a long time. And it was really kind of unleashed upon the population. And, and that, that, that uh, ruling by the Supreme Court really blew the gates wide open. Right. Um, and at that point, it was uh, everything was pretty much fair game. And I think probably uh, you saw a lot of the uh, racial animosity amped up and everything. Uh, probably 2014, 2015 is where I, I see um, 
all of the different intersectional grievances and things like that really starting to come to a head. Uh, and I think that, again, you have significant demographic transformation. You've had prolonged uh, cultural transformation. And I think you, we cannot underestimate the role technology has played in all of this and how yeah. ubiquitous it is for people. And you just can't escape the messaging in a lot of ways. It's also been much easier to track people and tailor messaging to people and find their weak points. And also in all of this, to single out and identify and dox and destroy people mm -hmm. who speak out. So there's a lot of things there. Yeah, it's amazing to think about, I forget what year it was, but it was a, not that long ago in terms of history, but you know, California voted against gay marriage. And then Oberfell was what? I mean, just a handful of years after that. I mean, California, you know, we think of them as being, you know, crunchy granolas out there and anything goes, but that's how far we've come. That's what I always try to explain to people when they think, oh, it's not that bad. Like <laughs> California's voting against this. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we have the death of states' rights. And all of a sudden the Supreme Court is going to tell us what to do, just like they've done, you know, the Civil Rights Act and all sorts of stuff like this over the years where they try to make it seem like this wonderful thing. And all it does is, you know, keep people from living as they see fit. And these are the same people that want to talk about human rights and their democracy advocates and all this kind of stuff. And as we know, they are not, they are totalitarians. And yeah, I mean, and when think about, you know, when um, Oberfell, the Supreme Court, you know, made that the quote unquote law of the land or whatever. Oh, you know, all these people say it's going to lead to pedophilia. Oh, it's going to lead to all this kind of stuff. You're so crazy. Love is love, right? You know, you're talking about the branding and it's like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all the warnings, all the things that people said it was going to like open the Pandora's box have happened. And yet still people still have their head in the sand. Now, I, I got to say something. I don't watch a lot of TV, but my kids um, have this little free thing on whatever, not Netflix. We don't have Netflix. Amazon, I guess, where they're able to watch MLB games for like two weeks for free and they love baseball. Well, I don't understand how people can watch normal TV at all ever and say that they can you know how they can have their heads in the sand about any of this stuff because it's inescapable driving down the road billboards i mean it's just like the COVID stuff you know behind the pitcher's mound is you know a get a jab billboard you know it's just crazy so i really am hoping that your research is going to wake up the good people because um you know, if you do care about your children, and that's how I come at this from not just a Christian perspective, because I do see this as an inversion of Christianity. It's all um, to mock Christ, but it is also a war on my children, just like anti-whiteness is a war on my white sons and my white husband, you know, um, and then family too, you know, we're talking about, oh, war on family. But if you have community, if you have LGBT community, well, you can have a glitter family, right? You know, I mean, I just, it, do you think people, <laughs> do you think people are going to wake up? And I guess that leads to some of my last questions would be your predictions, your advice, you know, besides getting your book and reading it and buying a lot of copies for people whose minds can maybe be changed or who can be inspired to be brave. Um, what are your predictions for the future? Um, any advice? Well, uh, first of all, you're awfully kind to say that. <laughs> Once again, very, I'm very flattered. Uh, anytime anyone has any, they you know, just, I'm blown away, really. Um, but yeah, my advice would be that, um, and as the conclusion, I, I won't spoil too much here, uh, sort of ties all these things together that um, this is systemic. And when I say systemic, uh, I, I mean, it is every aspect of the system. So you're right. So it's the anti-white, it's the jab, it's the trans, it's all of that. It's all feeding into this, basically, this desire to get everyone trapped within the system. So what I would recommend is uh, essentially to try to make as strong bonds as humanly possible uh, to make real communities with people, find like-minded people, um, and essentially make whatever steps that you can to uh, get out of the system or to live as far outside the system as you can uh, because it is 
it could, this is there there in my mind there are one of two ways this is probably going to go now I, I don't have the crystal ball and i don't know what i think is the what i think are the two most likely outcomes would be either the system just completely disintegrates and collapses uh under the, uh, just the weight of hyperinflation and decadence and violence and uh De just declining infrastructure and uh, apathy and all these other things. Um, or it kind of lurches on into this awful soul crushing techno futurism, which none of us want any part of. Uh, and so I would say the ability, if, if in fact they are trying to get control over everything, which includes the food supply, mm -hmm. you should grow your own food. Uh, you should have the ability to, if they say, well, you can't come in here and shop uh, if you know, you can't buy groceries if you haven't been vaccinated, we'll say, well, it doesn't matter. I got a field full of corn out behind me, uh, you know, and make all of these unofficial arrangements with people, trade with people uh, and try to create uh, fellowship, find other Christians, other people who believe what you believe in strengthen ties uh, in a real community. Uh, so I know that, uh, you know, that a lot of this maybe sounds sort of prepper-ish, but I, I think that they, that, that that group of people has the right idea. Um, I think that what, what people should be doing is taking advantage of the ability to get large amounts of food uh, stocked up and put away to hedge against hyperinflation uh, and the ability of the system to try and control food supply to bring people in line. And they'll try to do this through monetary means too, right? Threatening your job, uh, all, all sorts of different institutions, academia, uh, the healthcare, government are mandating and, and actually mandating, even though of course, right? It was just a conspiracy that they were gonna mandate. No, mandating that you get a jab, mandating. Right. So on pain of losing your job, so they want to destroy your livelihood uh, if you don't comply. So how do you do that? Now, I, I mentioned there's the trap, of course, of property tax. Somehow you have to get some money in order to pay property tax. If you're not on the property ladder, they're making it damn hard to get on it with BlackRock buying up all these houses and uh, you know land being bought up by all these corporations. But if you can maybe even go in on something with some people uh, and make a plan and make contingency plans and... Um, do your best to make sure that you will create these bonds to protect each other. Uh, if you can do livestock, I mean, that's hard. Um, it, it, it take, th there's a very steep learning curve with agriculture, uh, let alone animal husbandry. So I would recommend people start right away. Yeah, um, I can grow jalapenos and okra. That's it. <laughs> now, oh, so now, if I didn't know you were Southern, now I know. <laughs> Well, I try to grow all these other cool things and it doesn't occur. So I can be a jalapeno slash okra farmer. <laughs> Perfect. Well, you can trade, then you trade with yes. uh, the neighbor who is, who is, uh, makes, you know, who grows peas or something. Yeah. And, uh, and, and <laughs> between, between the, the lot of you, 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 you got full meals that right. you make. <laughs> um, you know, we do, we do mostly corn, uh, but we do some, we do a lot of gardening here too. Um, not much in the way of husbandry actually. Um, but you know, we do a lot of corn, uh, we do some potatoes. We do, uh, I'm a big parsnip guy, actually, and believe it or not, parsnips grow quite well here. Huh. Um, and, uh, we do, um, a lot of other smaller things. I've got, I've gotten some peppers, tomatoes, you know, a lot of standard, um, type stuff, but, uh, I, I would focus on calorie dense foods as well. Potatoes are great. I mean, they'll grow anywhere pretty much. Just do some research, find what, what grows in your zone uh, and, and specialize in a couple of things and really perfect it, find out what they need. Um, but I would, I would absolutely uh, encourage people and make sure that they have a, a, uh, an independent source of water as well, of course, right. because you, you've got to have it. Uh, and maybe some of the, so if there's some kind of a collapse, which I think is very possible, uh, I am I am certain that there will be some kind of economic calamity. I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, the world is going to end or anything like that. I mean, who the hell knows at this point? You know, God may decide to send out fiery judgment looking at all this business going on. Uh, I'm not going to lie. And, and I, like you, agree that as anti-Christian, you see all these invocations of Baphomet 
uh, who's got this sort of hermaphroditic uh, character, um, there's all these inversions. And, and, and consider, of course, that Satan can only invert, corrupt, uh, and approximate. He cannot create. So that's what this all boils down to. And it's the same thing with even trying to create the artificial intelligence um, that's going to help power a lot of this transhumanism thing. It's not a real living organism. Only God can do that. Yeah. So these, I think that having uh, understanding the word and looking at what is in the word, I think is also vital. I think because things are going to get very difficult to head, regardless of whether or not either of the things that I've sort of roughly outlined, I think will happen, do in fact happen. I'm sure there will be economic setbacks in the near future with the housing market and with hyperinflation. And I think it's just good practice to have the uh, uh, to have spares of the things that you need, particularly food. Um, but to have, if you don't have a well or a creek or a pond or something nearby to have, you, you'll have to figure out some way to get access to clean water. Because if they want to control people, that is what they will control. Um, and and that, that is part of getting everyone in line. And that's why they want people in the cities. Um, it's also easier to track and monitor people doing that. Uh, and if you are independent and you are, or at least somewhat independent, I mean, it's, it's damn hard to be truly independent in this system. Yeah. Uh, but if you can be somewhat independent and, and certainly resilient, uh, when some of the real tough things start coming along, uh, if they do, you'll be much better prepared. Um, I don't put too much stock in uh, precious metals. I know a lot of people are very into that. Um, I think if you need the goods, you should have the goods um, or, the, or the means to produce the goods. So uh, th that would really be my advice to people, but also having the right, having conversations about these things, um, you know, suss out the people before you do it, of course, because there's Stasi everywhere that want to destroy you figure out where someone stands and build some conversation, maybe wake them up a little bit with these kinds of things and some of the other things that are coming our way, as I mentioned, in terms of, you know, the housing bubble maybe or different things like that. And I think that the people who are resilient and who have strong faith uh, in Christ will be the people who weather the storm and can start putting the pieces back together in a way that is natural it is a way that we should be living not this awful monstrosity before us but unfortunately like pulling off a band-aid there's going to be some pain oh, yeah. uh, in the in the short term yeah i'm gonna have to meet somebody who has cows so i can get some beef that's for sure <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Um, well, and I'll end this with my silver lining is the marginalization of sane people, of traditionalists, of Christians, of just normal everyday conservatives, you know, true conservatives, people who want to just be left alone pretty much. Um, it's, it needs to happen because we're all still comfortable to a degree and until it gets worse, we're not going to really I've been doing some of it you know I've been really trying to build community and get together with like-minded people and have each other's backs but it needs to happen more and you know when poop hits the fan that's when you're really going to need people so um, you know find those people who don't kneel before false gods uh, those people who are willing to stand up and speak truth plus you know the whole gaslighting thing that you speak so well to in your book you're not being gaslit lit by these people who you're hanging out with and trading with because they're all sane like you so it's actually a win-win you know um you know you're you're helping to subsidize whatever they're growing and you know they're helping you out or you're bartering or whatever and then you're hanging out with people who aren't just constantly telling you lies and telling you that you're the crazy person so I'll end this with, uh, I saw a baseball hat the other day that I think I'm going to get because it, I think, embodies everything we're talking about. It just says no on it. And I want that baseball cap. It just says no, because I'm saying no to all of this madness. <laughs> I love it. Nancy Reagan, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> but it literally just says N-O on it. You know, that's it. Whatever you're going to tell me, nope, I don't believe you. Well, anyway, um, the gates of hell shall not prevail, Scott. You know this. 
Um, God bless you for your work and for writing this book. And I'm so excited that you're already writing another one. I'm super jealous as a person who has written zero books, but tell us how we can follow you. Can we, are you even followable? <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, not anymore. Um, you know, I, I had a Twitter, uh, which was shut down. And uh, uh, hilariously, of all things, the tweet that got me shut down was uh, I, I said, Jamira Kwai tried to warn us. Uh, and if anyone remembers him, he was, I mean, I think he's still around, but was a singer from the 90s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that the song Virtual Insanity, if you look up the lyrics, uh, it's, it's got a, a lot to do with uh, what I'm talking about here, which is kind of funny, but of all things, that's what got me shut down. Uh, so <laughs> until what? I can, right. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Um, uh, very crazy actually, but, um, I'm sure that there was something else they, they had, uh, that they, you know, they didn't like what I had to say and that, you know, of course they don't, cause I'm trying to expose them, but, um, <sighs> really that's about it. Um, so if, if I can get on any social media at some point, uh, you know, if, if I can figure that out, I'll try. Um, I would say, unfortunately, there's not really any way to follow me. You can um, pick up the book, uh, spread the word as far as that's concerned. Um, you know, check out other titles from uh, Antelope Hill has got a lot of great titles. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if I'm able to make a comeback in any kind of followable way, uh, I, I'll do my best to get the word out. Well, awesome. And I would love to have you back on the show when your next book is out. And if you're on social media, you'll never have the time to write your book. So it's probably <laughs> a blessing that you're not on there wasting your time like the rest of us. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott. Well, thank you uh, so very much. Um, just uh, stay safe out there. Keep on growing all your corn. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.